This is Think Energy, the podcast that helps you better understand the fast-changing world of energy through conversations with game changers, industry leaders, and influencers. So join me, Dan Sege, as I explore both traditional and unconventional facets of the energy industry. Hey everyone, welcome back. Energy and climate change are important topics that have been increasingly discussed in recent years due to the significant impact they have on the environment, the economy, and society as a whole. The effects of climate change, such as rising sea levels, increased frequency of extreme weather events, and loss of biodiversity are widely recognized by the scientific community. However, there are different views on the best ways to address these issues, particularly in terms of energy policy and the way we live, work, consume, and travel. While some advocate for the transition to renewable energy sources, others still argue for the continued use of fossil fuels or the development of other technologies such as nuclear energy. These differing perspectives have created a complex and often polarized debate. It is important to approach these discussions with an open mind, consider the evidence, and engage in constructive dialogue to find common ground and solutions that work for all stakeholders. We've often heard that working together and respecting different opinions are essential for effective collaboration and innovation. For climate change, it's more important than ever that we come together to work towards a common goal. So, here is today's big question. When it comes to energy and climate, are we able to consider diverse perspectives so we can identify blind spots and challenge assumptions that will ultimately lead to a stronger way forward for Canada? Today, my special guest is Dr. Monica Gattinger. She's the director of the Institute for Science, Society, and Policy. She's a full professor at the School of Political Studies and founder, chair of Positive Energy at the University of Ottawa. Monica, welcome to the show. Now, perhaps you can start by telling our listeners a bit about yourself and how the Positive Energy program that you founded at the University of Ottawa came to be. Thanks, happy to. So I'm a professor at the University of Ottawa and I've been a student of energy, um, Dan, it kind of pains me to say it, for, but going on three decades now. Um, and I guess about maybe a, a 10 years ago or so, around 2014, 2015, uh, you might remember at that time there was a lot of contentiousness um, in the energy sector, particularly around pipeline uh, development. And, and I think, you know, I felt a certain frustration that I'd go to energy conferences and we'd all kind of get concerned about this and, you know, I don't know, throw our hands up in the air, uh, but what was happening and then walk away, come back at the next conference and do the same thing. Um, So the idea that I had was to create an initiative that would convene leaders who were concerned about these issues of public confidence and energy decision making, convene them together to try to um, identify what some of the key challenges are. And then I would undertake with a research team, some solution focused applied academic research to actually feed that process on an ongoing basis. So it's, you know, not just conferences, we walk away, conferences, we walk away. It's let's put in place a process to actually, <clears throat> excuse me, to actually get to uh, some solution seeking on the challenges. Okay. Now, I have to ask you because I love the name. Given how polarizing energy has been for a number of years now, is the name meant to have a double meaning? <laughs> yes, it is. You are exactly right. Um, that was, you know, at the time when we created that name, that was precisely what we were trying to do, which is let's have some positive discussions about energy. I think the other thing I'd point to is, you know, for us, and it's always been the case that energy is all energy. Uh, so yes, at the time when we created positive energy, you know, what was in the news was was big pipelines. Uh, but many of these issues and the challenges that, that we address with our work um, apply to all energy sources, whether it's, you know, electricity, 
oil and gas, uh, at the upstream, downstream, uh, midstream sectors. So we really wanted to try to uh, foster a pan-Canadian approach on, uh, on the issues with energy as the core. Monica, in one of your research reports, you acknowledge that division is eroding public trust and preventing progress. Why is that happening? Is it a lack of understanding around climate change and Canada's goals? Or is it more about the method or policies in place to get there? That's a super important question. And Dan, and it's really at the heart uh, of what we're aiming to do at, at Positive Energy. So if you look at where we're at now, um, on energy and climate, um, there's you know a tremendous global move uh, towards net zero, and of course this is going to mean just a, a wholesale transformation of our energy systems and and broader economy. So you know there are bound to be disagreements and division over how we go about doing that. And I think you know one of the crucial things about the this energy transition in comparison to previous energy transitions is that it's going to be largely policy driven. Like yes, there will be market developments, but policy is going to be playing such an important role. So to your question, you know, a lot of this is around the methods or the policies that we're going to be putting in place uh, when it comes to, to energy uh, transition. And I think our work really starts from the, the, the you know, the, 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 the very strong belief that if we don't have public confidence in government decision making over energy and climate, we're not going to be able to make um, ongoing forward progress on uh, either energy or uh, or climate objectives. And for us, public confidence is, you know, the confidence of people, whether as citizens, as consumers, as community members, but it's also the confidence of investors, right? We know that we're going to need a tremendous amount of new energy infrastructure without the investor confidence to make that happen. Uh, we're not going to be able to to uh, you know achieve the emissions reductions that are envis envisaged. So for us, that whole question of division and how do we address division where it exists is just fundamental to uh, to our efforts. Okay, now, do you think we lack a shared positive vision as Canadians on the future and how we get there together? How do we build bridges? Is this what you're trying to achieve with positive energy? Yeah, I'd say yes and no on the shared vision. So, you know, we do a lot of public opinion polling research, as, as you might know, Dan, and, and you know, uh, uniformly, Canadians score governments very poorly on whether they are succeeding in developing a shared, uh, a shared vision for Canada's energy future. Um, that said, you know, I, I don't see it all as, as all bad news. There is remarkable alignment of views among Canadians on many aspects uh, of the country's energy future. I think sometimes what, what we tend to hear, um, you know, are the voices in political debates and in the media in the, and in the media that are on, you know, sort of opposite ends of a spectrum. If you look at, you know, sort of where Canadians are at uh, in general, um, you know, in terms of the, the majority opinions, um, they're often much more aligned than what you might think uh, by listening to some of our political debates or, or reading uh, the media. So I think what we're trying to do at Positive Energy is, is a few things. One is, you know, to really try to see just how divided are we? Uh, and a lot of our work has um, brought forward that we're not as divided as we might think on some of these issues. I think the second thing we're trying to do is provide a forum uh, for people who do want uh, to work constructively and positively uh, to chart a positive path forward, provide that forum for, for those uh, to do that, and then to undertake academic research to support that. And one of the things that, that we found is that there's just a tremendous appetite for that kind of, uh, that kind of initiative. Okay, Monica. Um... Hoping you can shed some light on this next item. What do you mean when you say that Canada is at a logjam when it comes to charting our energy future? That's a great question because, you know, when I think about when we wrote that, that was a few, that was written a few years ago. So to kind of answer that question a little bit differently now than I would have if you'd asked it uh, at the time that uh, that we wrote it. So if you think about, you know, cast your mind back to kind of 2015 uh, and the creation between the federal government and the provinces of the, of the pan-Canadian framework on clean growth and climate change, there was a lot of alignment between the federal government and provinces and territories uh, around climate change. And then we had some electoral turnover 
turnover, new governments coming into power at the provincial level in the round sort of the 2018 uh, period, and that relative peace between federal and provincial governments began to be uh, began to be overturned. And and so that you know the the logjam that we were referring to was really um, written at that period in time. We were seeing a lot of fractiousness between the federal government and provincial governments. And don't get me wrong, we still see uh, we still see some of that, but certainly not to the level we did uh, at that time. So I think you know over the last few years we've seen much greater alignment emerge uh, in the country, notably around the the concept of net zero, which we think is really 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 constructive progress. Um, I think where we see some of the challenges now is the moving to implementation, right? How do we move to reduce emissions and actually roll up our sleeves and do it uh, in a way that will build and maintain public confidence? That's, you know, that's very much where we're casting our efforts these days. Okay, cool. And what are some of the weaknesses you've found on energy decision making? So I think there are a few that that I would point to. Um, you know, one would be, and and our current work um, is zeroing in on this more than we have in the past, is the whole question of energy security. And by that, what what we're referring to is the reliability and affordability and availability uh, of energy. So in the absence, I mean, Dan, you know, you work at at Hydro Ottawa, so you would know when you know when the lights go out, um, people are you know it really captures their attention. I'll put it that way. <laughs> And so in the absence of, you know, reliable, affordable energy, um, it's going to be very difficult to make ongoing progress on emissions reduction. So that whole question of energy security is is, is one of the, what I'd say is sort of the, the weaknesses in the, the frame that policymakers are often bringing to, uh, to energy decision making. I think a second area uh, that really um, is going to need some attention is uh, our, our policy and regulatory frameworks for energy project decision making. I mean, we know uh, let's say, you know, take electrification. If we're going to be moving forward on electrification in a meaningful way, most reasonable estimates assume we're going to need to double or triple our generating uh, capacity in the country. And all the infrastructure, transmission, local distribution, all that that goes along with that, um, that's going to require building a whole lot of infrastructure. And so there's definitely some weaknesses there in, in our uh, existing frameworks for doing that. And then the third area I'd, I'd point to is um, collaboration between governments. And so yes, federal and provincial, but it's also increasingly municipal governments as well need to be collaborating uh, with other levels of government and indigenous governments too. So bringing together that that collaboration across jurisdictions is an area where there's a lot of uh, a lot of strength that we're going to need to be building. Okay, Monica, following up on this theme, Positive Energy has conducted a number of public opinion surveys since 2015 to gauge Canadians' support for the country's climate commitments and their views on our international credibility. What are some surprises and have you seen any change in the attitudes since you started the surveys? Yeah, we've done a lot of work. Uh, we have a f fantastic partnership with Nanos uh, Research. We've been working with uh, Nick Nanos and, and the Nanos team since uh, since 2015. So we've done lots of public opinion polling um, along the way. And so I think, you know, one of the things that has surprised me the most um, about this, and maybe it's just my own naivete as a, as a, you know, an academic researcher, but is just the pragmatism of Canadians. You know, many of the questions that we put to Canadians come back with very pragmatic and 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 balanced uh, responses. So there seems to be that recognition on the part of of Canadians of the need to take uh, a balanced approach to to energy and climate issues. So I'll give you just a couple of quick examples. So we've been tracking Canadians' level of climate climate ambition. Um, we started doing this actually during the pandemic. And so we asked people on a scale of zero to 10, where zero is now is the worst time and 10 is the best time uh, to take action on climate. You know, what, what, how would you score things? And you know the, the 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 majority of Canadians, you know, score things strongly. They want to see climate action. We've seen some weakening of that, um, notably as we've got uh, uh, some weakening of the economic uh, conditions that has weakened people's appetite. So that's sort of one thing. We you know Canadians want climate action. 
On the second, uh, no, the second thing I'd point to is um, we've done a lot of tracking as well around uh, Canadians' views on the importance um, of oil and gas to Canada's current economy and to its future economy. And so, you know, there again, we see um, what you might expect, which is people, there's a recognition that oil and gas is important to Canada's current enco economy. Um, views tend to drop off a little bit in terms of its importance to the, the, the future economy, but much stronger than I would have anticipated in terms of the level of, um, you know, um, opinions when it comes to the strength uh, or when it comes to the importance, uh, apologies, of oil and gas in Canada's current and future economy. One thing I'm just going to, you know, uh, like heads up, we've got a, a study coming out uh, very shortly and we've seen a jump in Canadians' views around the importance of oil and gas to the country's current and future economy. And we're thinking that this might be because of economic conditions having changed, you know, the war, Russia's war in Ukraine, um, just creating a different kind of an environment uh, for, for Canadians' opinions. Then the last thing I'd, I'd point to that for me is kind of been surprising, but in a not always fun way, is that we've also been tracking Canadians' views on government's performance on energy and climate issues. And Dan, it doesn't matter what aspect of government performance we ask people about, they always score it like so weak. Like weak to the point when we first asked this question, I'm like, Nick, do people, you know, just kind of score governments weekly? And so this is just, you know, typical stuff. He's like, no, Monica, that's really low scores. So I think there's a recognition there on the part of Canadians that governments have a lot of work to do, um, that this is difficult stuff uh, to, 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 uh, to take on, uh, but that we're going to need to if we're going to be able to achieve uh, some of our climate ambition in the country. Now, let's dig into the research. First, can you tell us who you're convening and bringing together to conduct your research and who your intended audience is? Who do you want to influence? Yeah, so we're bringing together leaders uh, from business, from government, and from government, we're referring to both policymakers and regulatory uh, agencies, uh, leaders from Indigenous organizations, from civil society organizations like environmental NGOs, uh, and then academics uh, like myself. And our aim is really with the research and convening that we're undertaking is to inform decision making. You know, so the key audience for for this, from our perspective, is government decision makers, whether policymakers or regulators, uh, at you know at, at any level uh, of government, uh, really. Um, more broadly, um, you know, our, we're working very closely with with the energy and climate community uh, writ large. Um, so our intended audience isn't, you know, sort of the general public per se, um, although I'd, I'd like to think that we're sort of working on their behalf in terms of a lot of the work, uh, a lot of the work that we're doing. Great stuff, Monica. Now, let's talk about your first multi-year research phase, public confidence in energy decision making. Why is it important to start here? Yeah, for us, this was really um, crucial um, to try to dig into and understand why are we facing these challenges to public confidence in decision making uh, for energy and, and climate issues. And, you know, <laughs> believe it or not, it we spent about two years trying to dig into that problem and identify all of its different uh, all of its different components. So we published a study in that first phase uh, of research called System Under Stress, um, where we were focusing in on energy decision making and the need to inform, uh, sorry, to reform energy uh, decision making. In that study, and this was sort of how we um, unpack this challenge of public confidence, we use this uh, metaphor of elephants horses and sitting ducks. And so the elephants were elephants in the room. So at that time, um, one of the big issues that was, um, you know, informing or, or leading to challenges in public confidence um, was that there was a belief on the part of, of quite a few folks that governments were taking insufficient action on climate change. And as a result of that, not having a forum, you know, to move forward uh, action on climate change, many folks who were concerned about that were uh, raising those issues in regulatory processes for individual energy projects, 
right? And if you're a regulator, you say, well, that's not part of my mandate. So what do, what do I do with this? And that led to some led to some challenges. Um, another elephant, you know, another elephant in the room at that time was reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. That there was insufficient action on the part, you know, on the uh, um, you know, in the minds of of, of many uh, around reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. And so, you know, some of the big challenges that Indigenous communities were facing, whether missing, murdered Indigenous women, um, you know, uh, potable drinking water, um, economic conditions, you know, a whole host of challenges were also being raised in the context of individual energy project decision making processes for lack of other forums to, to take uh, to take those uh, concerns to. Um, another elephant in the room was cumulative effects, right? So communities were concerned not necessarily about a particular project, but about the project that came before it, the project that was going to come after it, and what would be the cumulative effects on uh, um, on their community. So that was sort of the elephants, the elephants in the room, policy gaps, basically, that, that governments um, needed to take more action on to, to fill. When it came to the horses, those we were referring to horses that had left the barn. So in other words, changes in society and the broader you know context where you're not going to turn the clock back on them. So things like, you know, people expect rightly to have a say in decisions that affect them. Uh, they're not deferent, you know, they don't defer the way they used to, 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 to governments and to decision makers. They expect to have a say in decisions that affect them. And some of our decision making processes weren't, frankly, providing uh, sufficient uh, opportunities for, for, for them to be heard. Um, technological change. Right, you know, you're not going to turn the clock back on social media, uh, and that also has fundamentally changed the context in terms of how information circulates, uh, capacities for misinformation, disinformation, uh, etc. And so, in, the, in the, against this backdrop, you know, who are the sitting ducks? Well, the sitting ducks are government decision makers, right? They're trying to deal with all of these, uh, deal with all of these challenges. We got a lot of traction with that report, Dan, because I think it sort of helped people to. Um, you know, frame up what is the nature of the challenge that we're facing when it comes to public confidence, which, of course, then begins to open up solution spaces. OK, what did you uncover when it came to the role of local communities? Yeah, we did a major study uh, on this. It was some of this was happening concurrently, but uh, we did a major study with uh, in collaboration with the Canada West Foundation, where we um, did some very deep dive case study research on half a dozen energy projects uh, across the country, with the aim of identifying. Uh, drivers of local community satisfaction or dissatisfaction with energy project uh, decision making processes. So these were projects, you know, wind, gas plants, hydro facilities, transmission lines, pipelines, shale development, like a whole variety of, of different kinds of projects in different locations uh, across the country. And so there are a few things I'd point to there in terms of, of some of the key findings. Um, probably the first and foremost is the importance of early and mean meaningful consultation and engagement. And I feel kind of silly saying that because it's like, we have been saying this for years, how important this is, but yet, you know, there are still uh, proponents that that aren't necessarily, um, you know, aren't necessarily getting out there early and in a meaningful way uh, to communities. I think the second thing, and it's related that I'd point to is, is the importance of information. Like, yes, communities want information about a project, but it's an, what we referred to in the report is a necessary but insufficient condition, right? Just saying, you know, here's the project, here's the information, this should change your mind if you've got any concerns, really and truly is not, uh, is not enough. You need that meaningful engagement. You need to hear from people. And in some instances, this is a third thing I'd point to, in some instances, you know, it's important to draw the, the distinction between what a community's interests are. So it could be, you know, economic development, jobs, et cetera but also what their values are. And there may be some projects that even though they might advance communities' interests in terms of jobs, et cetera, if they run counter to community values and what they want to see developed in their community, um, it, it will be very challenging to, uh, to foster support for, uh, for a project. Another thing we found, just a couple more things I'd point to here. Another thing we found that I think is going to be increasingly important as we move uh, on net zero and emissions reductions, oftentimes at the community level, the key environmental issue is local environmental impacts as opposed to global 
climate change impacts. So even if you've got a project that's going to be good for the climate, if it's got local environmental impacts from the perspective of a community, those may actually, those concerns may actually trump the good that could be done uh, more broadly when it comes to uh, to the climate. And so I guess the, the last thing I'd, I'd point to is, you know, just the importance of process, having a decision making process in which people can have faith. And so, you know, we did a lot of like work right in communities. So you'd have community members saying like, I can get behind a decision that I don't agree with. You know, if my perspectives at the end of the day were heard in a meaningful way, were considered in a meaningful way, but governments decided to go in a different direction, I can, you know, I can live with that as long as I felt that the process was one that was legitimate. So that process piece, uh, so, so important at the community level. Okay. Now, what were some of the biggest takeaways from your project, Monica? Were you surprised by any of the data? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, I'd, I'd probably go back to um, the local versus global impacts piece. I think that is a circle we are going to have to figure out how to square, for lack of a better uh, a better uh, metaphor here, going forward, because many of the projects that we're going to need uh, in the years ahead in terms of emissions reductions, they are going to have local environmental impacts. Um, you know, and, and it doesn't take long to think about examples of that, right? So think about mining for critical minerals, think about transmission infrastructure, think, I mean, on and on and on. Um, and so thinking through how do we, um, you know, be respectful of local communities, ensure we've got processes in place that, that, that they can have faith in and ensure that, you know, local environmental impacts are mitigated in a meaningful, uh, in a meaningful fashion. And frankly, no has to be an option sometimes, right? There are some projects that that have to receive a no. If all projects are green lighted, that puts the entire system uh, into uh, uh, into question in people's minds. Okay, Monica, your second research phase just concluded. Canada's energy future in an age of climate change. What challenges and opportunities were you focused on and what did you uncover? That's a big question, Dan. So maybe just a couple of things I'll, I'll point to. Um, the first is to say that that you know, for that particular project, because it was uh, or that phase, because it got underway at a time where there was quite a lot of fractiousness between the the federal and provincial governments, um, we took on the the topic of polarization uh, in that phase of the research to try to understand you know just how polarized are we when it comes to uh, uh, to energy and climate issues and and the you know the 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 fortunate answer was that we're not as polarized as we might think on some of these issues. So those areas where, you know, people's opinions are truly at opposite ends of a spectrum, they've got their heels dug in, the opinions are very hardened and crystallized, they're not willing to move, you know, those are very few and far between. Um, a lot more of the division that we see, back to that word division that we talked about earlier, uh, Dan, it, 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 so those are opinions that are maybe a little bit more malleable uh, to change, where you can potentially bring people together and uh, have a constructive uh, a constructive conversation to, to move things forward. Um, so that the polarization, uh, the polarization work, uh, I think, was really important to to try to um, you know shine a light empirically on just how polarized uh, are we. One thing that did come out of that work, though, that I think is really important to note is that a lot of the polarization that we see um, is along partisan lines, and so it's really important to have and create nonpartisan. Uh, forums for people to come uh, together because that that partisan polarization on energy and climate issues can be quite uh, can be quite challenging. So we looked at polarization. We also looked at uh, we continued our work around sort of roles and responsibilities of different uh, government authorities in energy and climate uh, decision making. We did a really big project around energy regulators uh, with, you know, again, thinking about how important they are going to be in the future when it comes to um, energy project uh proposals uh, and evaluating energy project uh, proposals. Um, and I think, you know, what came out of that work is just the, the importance to create regulatory frameworks that are functional, right? They're going to enable us to get to a decision, but, the, but that are adaptable. You know, we know there are going to be new energy sources, new technologies. We're going to need to be 
to be adapting our frameworks over time and that are you know absolutely this crucial element and of legitimate that they are that people have confidence uh, in those decision making processes but it's not just about regulators it's also about the broader policy context within which they work you know the need for regulatory agencies to be operating in the context of clear policy frameworks um, you know for there to be a good understanding between policymakers and regulators of their respective roles when it comes to to things like energy project uh, energy project approvals the third area that we focused uh, in on uh, in this uh, most recent phase of research was models of and limits to consensus building right so if we do have division how do we try to foster consensus uh, and we recognize we're not going to get to you know everybody holding hands and singing kumbaya there this is politics there will be uh, there will be divisions but um, we did a lot of work on this whole concept of what are some of the models that can be utilized to foster consensus what are some of the limits to those models and the sort of bottom line uh, of that research is that progress uh, is possible when it comes to consensus building but it, it's not easy it's hard one it takes time. It takes a lot of thoughtful preparation and care to put in place processes that will drive towards uh, positive outcomes. Okay. Now, there were five case studies that came out of this phase intended to identify what works when it comes to public confidence in decision making. What are some of the highlights? Yeah, and this kind of picks up on the the, the question of consensus building and, and models of and limits to consensus building. So um, we undertook a number of, of case studies of different initiatives that have been tried in Canada to try to foster consensus. Uh, so we looked, for example, um, at the Alberta Climate Leadership Plan. Uh, we looked at the Ecofiscal Commission. We looked at the National Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy. We looked at the, the Just Transition Task Force uh, on the coal-fired power phase out. So this was a mixture of federal, provincial, you know, government, non-government, uh, current, past uh, initiatives. And there are a few things that, that I point to that, you know, came out of that work. The first is that there are no silver bullets. I mean, boy, wouldn't it be nice if there were easy answers to these really tough questions, but there are not easy answers to these really tough questions. Um, they, you know, it, it really is important to uh, to have kind of a multi-pronged approach and and more than one approach. There isn't going to be one single initiative that's going to uh, that's going to uh, to solve all of these challenges. Uh, but process matters. Process really matters. So who is involved? how are decisions taken you know is the process seen uh, as legitimate that's really you know absolutely the place to start with any of these processes around uh around consensus building um it, again information is a necessary but insufficient condition right so you can have in place uh, a process that is designed to you know bring forward recommendations to government on policy uh, but if people don't have trust in the information that's produced by that initiative you've got a problem right so i think the eco fiscal commission was really interesting in that in that case because it brought together an advisory board that included representation from a variety of different political parties the aim being to say if these folks can come together and you know work together and have confidence in this process then others uh, are more likely to have confidence in the information that's produced and the studies that are produced by, uh, uh, by in that case, the, the Ecofiscal Commission. Um, there are a lot of relationships between different processes. So, for example, you know, if you think about the, the development of a, a carbon uh, price in Canada, you know, yes, that's where the Ecofiscal Commission was focusing a lot of its efforts, but the Alberta Climate Leadership Plan uh, in part paved the way towards the development of a federal uh, price on carbon because of the work that was done in the province to put in place uh, a carbon pricing uh, a carbon pricing scheme. Um, and then the, the, the final thing, and this isn't something that people always like to hear, unfortunately, <laughs> is that it takes time. Building consensus takes time time and it's something that is as we know in the current context with you know with climate change is something that we don't necessarily have the luxury of having so it's how do you sort of hold those two things in 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 your hand uh at the same time and i often you know use the example of a carbon tax having a carbon tax in canada is a massive achievement for the country but it took probably a decade or more 
to get there. And that's only one small in the big scheme of things, policy tool. Um, so, you know, no silver bullets. It takes time, but it is possible. So progress is possible, but it, it, it's hard one. Okay. Now, this was fascinating, Monica. You identified two realities of energy and environmental leaders in Canada when it comes to Canada's energy transition. Maybe you can unpack that for us just a bit more. Yeah, for sure. So this was a really, uh, really neat study. We one of the things that we found in our work because we convene when we are, you know, uh, very close to a lot of energy and and environmental leaders. One of the things that we were finding is that this word transition was um, could uh, had elements to it that were kind of that could be polarizing. And so for some folks, it was something that actually drove them away from our table rather than bringing them to our table. So being academics, we thought, well, let's do a study on this. What do people think transition is? What does it mean to them? Why are we running into these issues? And um, I have to credit our former research director, Dr. Marissa Beck. This was her idea. It was her study. She did an absolutely tremendous job. So she went out there and spoke with it was over 40 energy and environmental leaders across the country. And and what you know what emerged from that work was that there were really two different realities uh, that people inhabited either you know sort of in whole or in part uh, when it comes to to transition. And we didn't name the realities. We just stated them you know in in a very uh in a very sort of fact-based way and they differed in terms of scope um and pace of change and you know so f in in one of the realities you know the the idea is that we're going to have a more measured pace of change it's going to be driven by market developments some policy developments um, we're going to in the future have you know an, a diverse energy portfolio that's going to include um, you know a variety of different energy sources yes in different proportions than we currently have them but uh, you know that oil and gas for instance is going to be part of a uh, part of the future so that's sort of one reality the other reality Reality grounded in a much more, you know, um, ambitious, rapid need for change, quickly grounded in science, much stronger role for government in terms of setting out the policy framework, um, much greater attention to the need um, you know, to uh, uh, notably to uh, phase down oil and gas, and in particular oil. Um, and so you can imagine, Dan, if you've got folks inhabiting these different realities, it is difficult for them to come together because they're often talking past uh, they're often talking past one another. and And so we didn't necessarily have any solutions for this proposed in that particular uh, in that particular study. I think our work really does try to uh, do some convening uh, around those issues. But what it really did, and this particular study resonated so well, with folks in the energy uh, and environment communities. We had people saying like, you just nailed it. Yes, that is exactly what is happening right now. And so you would have folks say, you know, well, the reality is, or we just need an honest conversation. Um, but what the reality meant to them, what an honest conversation would mean to them was, was something completely different uh, than folks inhabiting a, a, the other reality. And so these are the kinds of challenges, you know, Dan, that we, we hope to shed light on with our work and we also hope to, uh, also hope to address with uh, the research and convening as well. Now, your third phase has just begun. What can you tell us so far about strengthening public confidence on the road? to net zero and the areas you're looking to cover in your research over the next several years. Yeah, no, the great opportunity to to share this with you, Dan. Thanks, uh, thanks so much. So, yeah, I mean, if our first phase was focused on public confidence and kind of the here and now, second phase was Canada's energy future in an age of climate change. This phase is the longest term. Uh, longest term phase yet in terms of looking at uh, net zero and, and, and looking at 2050. Um, we've got four areas that we're focusing in on. 
in terms of this research um, that really build in many ways on the work that we've done to date. Um, we've been talking so far, Dan, about the importance of, of regulation and having energy project decision making systems that are going to foster uh, and support the kind of change to our energy systems that we're going to need. That's a big, uh, a big area for us. One of the areas as well that we're going to start to be uh, getting into in a, in a more meaningful way is downstream regulation as well, because with the, um, you know, with the growing um, attention to electrification, this is going to mean, you know, greater focus to what are our regulatory frameworks for energy delivery, whether it's in power markets or in gas markets. Um, and we think that there's there's something that we will have to offer there as well in terms of uh, in terms of our work. So that's on the regulatory front. Um, Another topic area that that for us we think is really important is this whole question of energy uh, security. And by that, you know, again, this isn't just about what's happening in global energy markets, it's what's happening domestically as well in terms of the need of um, the need to have reliable and affordable energy to ensure that we don't, you know, take one step forward and then two steps back on emissions reductions. So it's really very much about solving for, yes, emissions reductions and affordable, reliable energy simultaneously, which in our observation is something that, you know, has not always been on the, the radar of policymakers. I think the energy system has just done such a great job of providing reliable, affordable energy that uh, it's not always thought about. Uh, and yet, you know, if we're going to be transforming our energy systems, it better be front and center, uh, or we could really run into some challenges in terms of public confidence in uh, on the road ahead. The third area um, we're, we're zeroing in on is intergovernmental collaboration. We are a federation. Uh, we are a federation with increasing roles and authority for Indigenous governments uh, as well. So it's really about how do we make sure we've got good collaboration uh, between federal, provincial, territorial, Indigenous and municipal uh, governments on, on the road ahead. And again, it's that kind of collaboration, uh, collaboration piece. Um, and then finally, we're going to continue with the public opinion survey research. And that work generally aims to support the other streams of research. So we're asking questions that relate to uh, some of the broader, uh, some of the broader work that we're doing. Cool. Okay. I know you're going to tell me it's early, Monica, but based on what the data and public service have shown over these many years, is net zero resonating with people? Well, interestingly, so last June, uh, we held a, a conference to mark the, you know, the the conclusion of phase two and the launch of phase three. Um, and we did some public opinion survey research going into that conference, including some questions around net zero. So we asked people if they had heard about net zero. And then we asked them, you know, the dreaded open ended question. And what does it mean to you? Uh, so it's one thing to have heard about. It's another thing to, to you know, be asked to define it. And I was really surprised, Dan, like the, the majority, like a strong majority of people had heard of net zero and when asked to define it, provided a definition that was pretty on target. So people, you know, I don't know if that means it's resonating with people, but they have definitely absorbed that, that this concept and that this is uh, something that, uh, um, you know, is, is in policymakers, um, is in policymakers' minds. I think the other thing I would note though, is you know there's net zero and then there's just emissions reductions writ large the work that we've done around canadian support for emissions reductions climate change policy etc shows just time and again canadians want to see this they want to see emissions reductions they want to see it done in a balanced way back to the the pragmatic uh, response i was giving earlier uh but they're definitely uh definitely committed to that okay now when do you expect your first publication will be shared so we've got our our quarterly public opinion surveys that come out um, every few months. We actually have uh, some, we're just finalizing a study right now that will be published very, very shortly. In terms of the research uh, publications, we've got two underway right now uh, that should be published within the next uh, number of months. One is looking at um, regulation for project decision-making and in particular, this whole question of timelines. So if you talk with folks, you know, in industry and in government right now, they'll say, well, we got a build all this stuff, but can we build it fast enough? And so that's actually the title of the project. Can we build enough fast enough? And we're focusing in on what are some of the issues when it comes to um, 
regulatory frameworks for project decision making. So that's one study that should be coming out within the next few months. And then a second one, um, it's republication of a, a study that um, we uh, completed uh, for the Canadian Gas Association, Electricity Canada, and Natural Resources Canada about this time last year, uh, which was looking at um, regulation of energy delivery systems in power and gas markets. You're looking at international case studies to try to identify, like, how are other countries grappling with the challenges of net zero in their power and gas markets? So um, we're going to be updating and republishing that study. We're in the process of doing that right now. That should be coming out in the next few months. Um, and the case studies that we're looking at in that research are uh, Western Australia, the United Kingdom, which, as you might imagine, is a very interesting case study, given the challenges that they've had in their power and gas markets, uh, and New York State. Uh, just wondering here, is there anything you can tell us about your appointment to the province's new energy transition panel, its objectives, and how you feel this could move the energy conversation forward in Ontario? Thanks for the the question. I mean, I, I'm, you know, let's be honest, I'm an energy geek. <laughs> and so it is just an unbelievable honor uh, to have been appointed to the panel. This, this for me, this is a dream uh, appointment. I'm just so, so, so enthused uh, about it. Um, I'm not going to be able to speak on behalf of the panel. It's too early in our work, but I will just share, you know, in my personal capacity uh, that I think the panel does have the capacity or the potential to be uh, really quite important uh, to the province's energy future. So if you think about, you know, the research that we've been doing at Positive Energy, the, the, the importance of informed decision making right on the part of governments to recognize all of the strengths, limitations, consequences intended or otherwise uh, of their uh, decisions on energy and climate. So the panel, I think, has a, a great opportunity to help inform uh, decision making. But but as I've said on a couple of occasions today, information is a necessary but insufficient condition, right? Process matters. And, you know, the the panel, again, has the potential to be a very important process in terms of its engagement and meaningful engagement uh, with stakeholders, with Indigenous partners, uh, with all of those who are interested in, in the province's uh, energy future. So, you know, a couple of just additional things I, I would say. One is that the panel's focus uh, in its mandate on long-term energy planning, I think, I think is very important because we're going to need to plan uh, and think through the long-term more than we ever have before in terms of our energy systems when it comes to um, when it comes to emissions reductions. And I think the other thing, you know, I would lastly but not leastly, I would recognize, um, you know, the, the importance um, of affordability and reliability. Uh, you know, yes, undertaking emissions reductions, but ensuring it's done in a reliable and affordable way um, that it enables, you know, economic competitiveness uh, and the like. And that's something that, you know, that this government, uh, Ontario government brings to the table, which I think is extremely uh, important and will be crucial for the future. Okay, Monica. Now, if you could speak to everyone in Canada, what would you want people to know that you think is not widely known or understood? Yeah, there are a few things I would point to there. I think one would be the scale of the transformation that we're contemplating with net zero. I mean, if you take electrification, just as an example, you know, about only about 20% of end use energy, I mean, I'm telling you this, Dan, you know all this stuff, but only about 20% of end use energy, you know, is, is currently accounted for electricity. Um, if we're looking to scale that up, you know, depending on what model you look at, but let's say you're looking to scale that up to, you know, 80%, that's four times what it, where it currently stands. This is a massive massive transformation of our energy systems and broader economy and i think that's one area where you know there isn't necessarily as much understanding as there could be in terms of the scale um, i think the second thing that that i would love to get out there is that you know there's often a view that industry is is you know dragging its heels it's you know putting in place roadblocks it's acting as a barrier that's not what i see in our engagements with folks in industry across the country and a whole variety of different energy, uh, different en segments of the energy sector. Um, industry is there 
uh, what, you know, the, the real challenge now is kind of how do we move from the what to the how and foster, create an environment that will foster the kind of change that uh, the companies are really looking to make. And then the third area that, that I would point to is reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. We haven't spoken about that too much uh, this morning, but that's one of the areas over the last number of years where there has just been such a fundamental change in the way industry and Indigenous communities and governments are working together. I think what we often see in, you know, in the newspapers, in the media, is instances of conflict, um, you know, for obvious reasons. That's, that's, you know, what the media is going to be drawn to. But there are so many examples of just unbelievably constructive, meaningful partnerships between Indigenous communities and, and industry. Uh, and I think that's something that, you know, that, that uh, really is, is just a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful change over the last few years. Lastly, Monica, we've always end our interviews with some rapid fire questions. I'm hoping you say you're ready. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. I'll, so I'll do my best. Here we go. What are you reading right now? I am reading The Heart Goes Last by Margaret Atwood. You would think, you know, during a global pandemic, you wouldn't read dystopic fiction, but that's what I'm doing. <laughs> terrific, uh, terrific book. Um, by Margaret Atwood. Okay, Monica, what would you name your boat if you had one? Or maybe you do have one. I do not have one, but if I did, I think I would name it Smooth Sailing because that's what I'd want to be doing when I was on my boat. Okay. Um, who is someone that you really admire? Oh, without question, my parents. Um, you know, we've had some pretty tragic things happen in my family, and they have, you know, continued to be positive, soldier on, be great grandparents to my kids. Uh, I don't know how they do it. I admire them uh, to the moon and back, as they say. Okay, moving on. What is the closest thing to real magic that you've witnessed? That's a tough one. I think I'd say I spend a lot of time in the outdoors. Uh, we have dogs, so I'm often out with the dogs. I ride horses, so I'm often out horseback riding. Um, anything in nature, there are so many magical moments where you see, you know, ways that animals are interacting with one another or things happening, uh, uh, things happening in the, you know, in, in, in the plant environment, in the ecosystem that to me are just magical uh, and remind me of uh, just how little we know about the world around us. Okay, Monica, that's cool. What has been the biggest challenge to you personally since the pandemic began? We've been, my family's been extremely fortunate during the pandemic. So um, uh, yeah, it, it feels almost kind of trite to talk about challenges. I think if there's one thing that I would point to though, um, it's the lost time. It's the lost time um, notably in, in my family's case, uh, between my sons and their grandparents. Um, you know, my youngest son, he used to go to his grandparents' house every day after school, they'd feed him snacks, he'd come home. That's gone. Uh, they've, you know, they've, they're missing him growing into a young man. That's, that's been really, really tough. I mean, it's a first world problem, Dan. I, you know, we really have been fortunate. Uh, but, uh, that lost time is unfortunately, you know, we're just not going to get that back. Now, We've all been watching a lot more Netflix and TV lately. What are some of your favorite shows or movie? I could like talk for hours about this, but if I had to just pick, let's, let's just pick one. The the whole Yellowstone series. I am just crazy for that series. You know, because I I uh, horseback ride, anything that involves horses and ranches, uh, um, my my own family history, uh, you know, involves homesteading. Um, just that that whole series, Yellowstone, 1883, 1923. And you want to talk about magic, Dan, the fact that all of that comes out of Taylor Sheridan's brain that fast. I have, I don't understand at all. Uh, but I, I really enjoy watching it. That series is just phenomenal. Lastly, Monica, what is exciting you about your industry right now? I think it's the, the people are now in the let's roll up our sleeves phase. And let's figure out how to how to you know how to get this done. Um, there's the waterfront of challenges seems endless, but the fact that that there's much more alignment um, among industry, government, civil society, you know, take your pick, indigenous organizations, uh, et cetera, about uh, ensuring that we're reducing emissions and you know the desire to work together to figure out how uh, to me is really exciting. Well, Monica, this is it. 
We've reached the end of another episode of the Think Energy podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. If our listeners want to learn more about you and your organization, how can they connect or find out more? We have a website uh, that you would be welcome to uh, uh, to reach out to. Just type into Google University of Ottawa Positive Energy and it should pop up uh, for you. Um, people are welcome to reach out to me personally. You know, again, e- easy to find me on the internet, email addresses and the like. I'd be happy uh, to hear from people. Again, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you had a lot of fun. This was great. Thanks, Dan. Really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of the Think Energy Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you're listening. And to find out more about today's guest or previous episodes, visit thinkenergypodcast.com. I hope you'll join us again next time as we spark even more conversations about the energy of tomorrow.